Closed Doors, A Study in Segregation by Ruth Whitehead Whaley Narrated by C.L. Hinton In proportion as men differ in race, characteristics, or ideas, just so much do they distrust, dislike, and abuse each other. The more unlike, the more disliked. The natural tendency of two unlike groups is to fear, hate, and exterminate the other. The stronger or better trained group becomes the dominant power. It cries aloud its superiority. Any indignity heaped upon the other group is justified in the name of their inferiority. Inferiority is an old misnomer for injustice. It is not the unique product of present-day conditions. Centuries ago, the Romans justified their world plunder by calling their victims barbarians. The nobility of Europe looks down upon the peasant who feeds them. The Norman called the Saxon inferior. Of this inferiority complex, the Negro in America has been and is the chief sufferer. He is called inferior because he is of a different race, different color, as an excuse for the indignity heaped upon him, a balm for irritated consciences. When two different groups are living side by side, there arise animosities and prejudices born of their ignorance each of the other. They have a mutual desire to exploit and exterminate. By the dominant group, the dominated is called a problem or menace. Thus, in America, the Negro problem. Where to relegate this black people? In what manner best to quell each noble impulse of theirs? How to feed each base inclination? The solution of this problem has been the chief pursuit of a vast majority of white America. The first solution attempted was slavery. But the economic advantage of unpaid free labor in the South over hired labor in the North was too great. Thus, slavery was ended, and incidentally, and as collateral to the main issue, the Negro was free. The second solution suggested was colonization in some possession of the United States or in Africa. It was never accomplished. The South was never willing to give up the easily exploited Negro labor. The second solution was cast aside. The third solution attempted is segregation, not the voluntary collecting of Negro as the word might denote, rather, the closed door. Thus far, and no farther shalt thou come. Segregation. Volumes might be written about it. It is the Negro's nemesis. The evil of segregation lies not alone in being excluded or relegated. It goes far deeper. The heritage of thinking black, the segregated atmosphere, the reaction upon the dominant group. If segregation consisted in nothing more than separate schools, churches, housing districts, etc., that alone, as despicable and undesirable as it would be, could not constitute the menace we now face. The most insidious weapon of segregation is the atmosphere it carries. This separating and setting apart is the most virulent expression of vaunted superiority. The dividing line is so visible until, being constantly seen, it nurtures a particular train of thought, a distinct psychological reaction. Segregation is the chief exponent of divine right of race. The tendency is for the dominant group to excuse and justify the segregation with false and illogical reasoning. They finally believe it. The segregated group becomes over-race conscious, hates bitterly, and loses the value of interrelation. The justification offered for segregation is the inferiority of the Negro. The blight of segregation is the belief in his inferiority it engenders in both groups. It colors the treatment which the dominant group gives the segregated. It has an unwholesome effect upon the oppressed. The Negro's place has usually been applied to him socially, industrially, or educationally. But in recent years, this place means also his residence. Segregation ordinances began to flourish in 1911. He must not live in certain restricted areas. To be more exact, he must not own homes or reside in certain restricted white districts. No one objects if he lives in the same house as servant with his employer. But to live in his own house next door? The proximity was too great. The real reason seemed to be fear of social equality. The mere proximity was not dreaded, but the character of the proximity. If as servant, no objection. If as owner, as resident, 
it couldn't be. It doesn't follow that segregation of the Negro in residential quarters will in any manner solve the race problem. The knowledge of the average white person concerning the Negro whom he dislikes is meager and usually based on hearsay or knowledge of the servant class only. If they are to be forever separated by iron bars, he will learn little more about him than he already knows. The acquaintance of one intelligent Negro would give him a different view of them, perhaps. Why relegate the Negro to certain sections if his taste and purse lead him elsewhere, so long as he conducts himself properly? Industry segregates the Negro, the reason he is shiftless. Remember that where the Negro has been given fair opportunity, he has proven these charges false. Segregation in industry begins in the labor unions, the irony of it. Certain jobs are gladly given him. That's his place. But many jobs are closed to him. Of these we speak. When segregation does not flourish, the Negro's good record is excused as being exceptional in the particular instance referred to. Educational segregation is not a myth. For even yet, there is a prevalent idea that classical and professional education should be denied Negroes generally. That, in spite of the record of hundreds and thousands of Negro college and professional graduates. One underlying objection to higher education is the knowledge that the educated Negro will not be so easily exploited. Having been trained in the same arts and sciences, there will be a closer consciousness between educated Negroes and educated whites, and Banquo's ghost, social equality, might become a reality. For it is folly to give persons the same advantages in contact during formative periods then ask them to forget it all and accept benighted dogmas again. But social equality does not of necessity mean wholesale intermarriage or race amalgamation. It does mean that each person will have the right to choose any other person for social intercourse, friendship, or marriage. And why not? In some sections, the Negro has been barred from any part in political affairs through various ingenious schemes. Where he has been allowed free use of the ballot, he has in most places until recently segregated himself. As in all other cases of segregation, it has proved detrimental to him. In the Negro world, there is one figure who is the victim of a twofold segregation and discrimination, the new Negro woman. Woman's emancipation is strangely parallel with the Negro's struggle. Inferiority is the reason given for her oppression. She has been considered as a mere chattel, cowed and subdued, taught that she, like children, must be seen and not heard, petted as an ornament of the home, a plaything for the male, producer of a line of warriors and race builders. Lacking all chance for development, she is called inferior because she hasn't developed. The Negro woman falls heir to all these prejudices, and to add injury to distress, she is a Negro. If there is any one person against whom the doors have been closed, it is the new Negro woman. As a woman, she was outside her sphere. As a Negro woman, she was impossible. In industry, education, and politics, she is gradually coming into her own. But remember, her closed doors are of the thickness of two. She is first a woman, then a Negro. May the fates be kind to her. A fair and thoughtful view of segregation leads one to believe that it is a futile gesture of the white man to the Negro, an expiring death groan ere the inevitable happens. It is impossible to stop the upward striving of the Negro by segregation. Their progress may be retarded, but time, the great winnower and sifter of truth, will aid them. The great mass of exceptional Negroes, who have attained far more than Negroes are supposed to attain, are now to be reckoned with. Closer association of the races in cities of the North and East produces both good and bad results. Seeing more Negroes, they of necessity see more bad Negroes. Also, more intelligent and ambitious Negroes than ever before. Theories are slowly and reluctantly being revised. The result is sometimes more segregation, sometimes less, dependent upon the innate justice and honesty of that particular group. But segregation, as terrible as it is, the curse of segregated atmosphere, as blighting as it is, will not forever be. The Egyptians and Babylonians once were supreme in power. 
They also enslaved and segregated. They are now a memory of history only. The ancestors of Horace and Socrates have so lost in prestige until Macaulay says of them, their people have degenerated into timid slaves and their language into a barbarian jargon. The barbarians, of whom Aristotle said, it is impossible for them to count beyond their fingers, did subsequently produce a Shakespeare and Newton. In the cycle of the years, the evolution and revolution of ideas and civilizations, the segregated Negro will also come into his own. He will lose his inferiority when and as he loses its mate, injustice. Finally, the shadow will be lifted. The closed door swings ajar.